Angel 656. Let's stand and sing. There's a call coming rescue. I'll go to Restless Wave. Send the light. Send the light. 656. Sing all three verses. morning. We are very thankful to have Barry and Cheryl Webb here with us this week and uh, they will be with us for special meetings uh, today, Monday night at 7, Tuesday night at 7, and Wednesday night at 7. So uh, a Sunday to Wednesday meeting and we hope you'll be back each evening and uh, pray that the Lord will continue to strengthen our church and to help us through these meetings. We already had a great opportunity yesterday with the gospel being preached to 32 golfers that came out uh, for our tournament. They had uh, a meal that we provided for them and, and then also the gospel. So it was a great opportunity. Pray that the Lord would give us fruit from that effort. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the great privilege that it is to serve you. And Lord, we pray that we would not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ and that we would proclaim it and that we would send it to the world through our missions program, through the opportunities that we have uh, with friends, neighbors, relatives, associates that we work with or to help us to be mindful of our need to get the gospel to the lost around us we love you so much lord we're looking forward to the day when you come and, and take us to be wherever you are and we can uh, be rescued from the presence of sin forever never to do anything or to think in a way that would dishonor you again uh, lord it's just such a great privilege to uh, live the victorious life to live a life that pleases you thank you for giving us that uh, righteousness in which uh, we are enabled to do it. Uh, we pray for your blessing over the preaching today. And Lord, we pray that you'd fill us with your spirit so that we might receive the word with gladness. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. We do welcome you this morning. We're glad for all of you who are here in person. And I uh, appreciate those that are watching as well by uh, a live stream of being able to do this too. Uh, but uh, I hope that uh, if you've been in live stream for quite some time now and out, out of the church that way, that now that restrictions are being lifted some, you'll get back into the house of God. It's, there's nothing like in-person worship with brothers and sisters in Christ like that. And, you know, and I remember even back when things were just a little bit open back in Maryland, uh, where our home base is, uh, we had a week of virtual revival meetings. We're only allowed to have 10 people in the church building at the time. So my wife and myself, two people that operated the equipment for the uh, video, and the rest of that was the pastor made five, but there were five more people each night that signed up on a sign-up list so they could be at church. And uh, they were there, five more bodies sitting in the crowd. 
And I'll tell you what, they, they, you would think that people like that would show up at the last second, you know, and then disappear before the last mm, on amen mm, of the last passion <laughs> prayer is there so they don't get around the, 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 the virus or whatever. But those folks stood around and talked for over an hour, some of them, because they were just missing being together as God's people. And we need that kind of fellowship. We need to be with, with the people of the Lord. So we're glad for all of you that are here uh, that, this way. And uh, hopefully with a smile on your face, can't tell some because of the mask uh, there too. But anyway, we're glad. For, uh, for that and we praise the Lord for your being with us and again we're glad for those that are watching with us as well. Aren't you glad today that salvation is free? Amen. If any one of us had to pay for it, none of us could ever afford it. But the Bible tells us the Lord Jesus Christ paid in full the debt of all of our sin for all mankind on that cross of Calvary. He paid the price of your sin as well as mine and uh, that means that salvation is a free gift that we can receive. I hope you've done that. If you haven't, I hope you will today before the service is over that you might receive that free gift of eternal life. But for those of us who have already received that gift, and I would suspect the majority of us here uh, probably already have, uh, that we would realize that there are others around us who still not, have not had that opportunity to do so. In fact, some of them have not even heard the truth about that gift, and it's our responsibility to share that message with them. In fact, if you've received that gift freely, the Bible says free freely, freely have received, freely, freely give. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you. Share his love as he told me to. He said, Freely, freely you have received. Freely, freely give. Go in my name as because you believe. Others will know. In earth and heaven, in Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name I come to you to share his power as he told me to. them eternal life as well. If you haven't been here when well, we've been here before, I'm an evangelist Barry Webb, of course, my wife Cheryl is uh, singing with me, and she'll be playing the piano as uh, we do special music this week and singing along with me as well. Uh, we are going to be doing some other special things during the meetings this week. There's a chalkboard on this side of the platform and a puppet stage on that side. Tomorrow night uh, is uh, Academy Night, uh, specifically school night, trying to encourage all the, uh, the students to come and the parents to come and their fathers and their blisters, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, all of those to come to the service uh, tomorrow night as well. And uh, so tomorrow night we'll be going to the Puppet Castle. We'll see if we can find anybody awake in a home over there that has a story for us. And uh, that means on Wednesday night we'll also be going back to the Puppet Castle uh, because we alternated the other night. So the only night we're going to be doing a chalk drawing will be Tuesday night in our service. So I want to encourage you to be prepared for that. And uh, we want to do as we've done before. For those of you that are familiar with how we do things in our meetings, uh, we're going to give away that chalk drawing on Wednesday night. Though we'll do it Tuesday. We'll give it away on Wednesday night to the folks who brought the most visitors with them all the way through 
our meeting. So from this morning uh, all the way through till Wednesday night, a visitor is someone who is not a regular attender of the church or school here, but uh, they came because you invited them to come. That's why uh, they came. You can't just see somebody you don't know walking across the parking lot, headed to the door and say, oh, you came my visitor. <laughs> that, that way that's cheating. Okay, no, can't do that. But if you invited somebody and they came not regularly uh, coming here, uh, then you can count them as a visitor. And whoever has the highest number of visitors uh, by Wednesday night uh, will uh, get the job drunk. So I want to encourage you to keep that in mind. And those of you that have seen those done before know what those are like with the colored light and the black light effects on them as well. So that will be going on on, on Tuesday night and then on Wednesday, as I said, the puppets will be back again with us then. So uh, lots of things going on. I encourage you to be inviting friends and neighbors and anybody else you can get to come to be here this week. If you'll be enthusiastic and be, uh, be, be excited, be everything but obnoxious. Uh, you'll hopefully be able to get somebody else to be able to come. Oh, but with COVID and all those things around, yes, even with COVID and all of those things around, we can get folks to come. We were just in Stockton last week, and of course, very similar situation, Christian school and whatever, and trying to get parents out. And, uh, you know, even uh, even Monday night, we had uh, two parents uh, and one of the students saved in the meeting. And so it's possible to do that. It's possible to get folks to come out as well. Uh, when we first started back into meetings last year, uh, after all the shutdown for so long, uh, our first meeting was in Indiana, and uh, it was a Sunday to Friday meeting. And uh, so we did three chalk drawings in a week like that, and a Sunday to Friday. The fellow who got the first place uh, drawing was responsible for 30 visitors in the meetings. Second and third place were tied at 15 apiece. So if they can do it, you can do it, amen? You can get a hold of folks, be enthusiastic, be excited, ask them to come and join us for the meetings this week. Now, you know, I play four different brass instruments, a trombone, that's easy, recognizable, and a euphonium, although when I play it, boys and girls, it's a myphonium, and you can't play it. Uh, that's the largest horn that I play. I have a bass trumpet I was playing during the congregational song just a moment ago that belonged to my father, and I'm keeping it busy for him since he's in glory uh, with the Lord, probably playing something a lot better up there. But in any case, then I have this horn that looks like a trumpet with a thyroid problem. It's not at all. It's called a fluga bone. That's a trombone with a slide taken off and valves put on instead. I guess if you're in the marching band where you normally see them, it keeps you from hitting the fellow in the row in front of you in the back of his head with your slide if you have a trombone. It's a regular one. I bought because it's the only one I can take overseas and it goes as a carry-on in the in one suitcase. But in any case, uh, I want to be able to play a song that my wife and I made an arrangement of uh, last year while we were off. Something could happen out of being off out of COVID. Uh, and our, at our home church, our pastor has been faithfully serving the Lord in our small church back in Western Maryland uh, for uh, 42 years now. Uh, and uh, we praise the Lord for his faithfulness. His favorite song, uh, hymn that he always requests, when there are for a hymn request, is He Hideth My Soul. A song uh, to encourage our hearts during a time when there's a lot of uncertainty and people are fearful of a disease and all the other circumstances that are going on around us in our life. We don't have to fear those things. We belong to the Lord. Amen. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be anxious or be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus is our shelter in the time of storm. He's our solid rock we can stand upon, and we can praise the Lord for the fact that He hideth my soul.
sermons on the table that'll be helpful for you. There's also a, a box that you can uh, give a special offering to Brother Webb. I hope you'll do that. We we have our offering box to the left as you go out. We'll be taking an offering for him uh, throughout the services that we have together this week. I hope that you will give in order to meet his needs. I was saying yesterday that God has given the gift of the evangelist to the local church, and it's a gift that stirs us up and keeps us going in the right direction so that we have the main thing is the main thing in our church and that is to bring the gospel throughout the world to make sure that we fulfill the great commandments as we do that. So I trust that you will give today and throughout the week as well. Thank you very much for coming. Hope you'll invite people out. Looking forward to what the Lord has ahead for us. Grab your hymnal 642. 642. We'll sing Bring Them In. One way you can bring them in is invite them. Let's stand and sing together. Heart tis the shepherd's voice on a year. 642. to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who said, other sheep have I which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. Pastor, I mentioned there's a table out there in the lobby to the right as you make your way out. In addition to the sermon CDs that are available there, there are music CDs as well, our family, our daughters. Uh, also, you can find uh, uh, out there audio and video versions of Bible stories from the Puppet Castle. Uh, there are four stories on three CDs, audio CDs, uh, that can be listened to, and there are four, uh, sure, excuse me, two stories on four DVDs out there, each uh, of the puppets that you can watch as well. And so let me encourage you to take your time to stop by and take advantage of those. There is one new recording out there that we did not have the last time we were here. It's uh, a recording that my father and his associate made a number of years ago in their ministry. Uh, my father, as I mentioned, was an evangelist that traveled for uh, 67 years preaching the gospel of Christ. There was another man who traveled with him as his music man for 45 of those years. His name was Brother Theron Babcock. Uh, Brother Babcock, my father said, was the only creature like him in captivity. 
<laughs> Reason being, he was a self-taught musician who was very, very talented. Guy gave him much ability. They carried a full Hammond organ along with them, as well as a Leslie speaker to go with it. Uh, in their meetings, they would set that up on the platform on about uh, over there where the castle was sitting, facing the crowd, and then they put the piano around 90 degrees to that, and brother back up the piano and the organ at the same time, as well as doing the pedals on the organ and chimes on the organ and other things that way as well. Uh, he played the accordion. Uh, he uh, he wrote music. As a matter of fact, every night when my father uh, did a gospel magic trick or a gospel object lesson, whatever you want to call it, uh, that would take about five minutes to do that trick. But while, before my father did that, he would have anybody, allow anybody in the crowd to raise their hand, he'd call on somebody to give Brother Babcock a title for a song. It could be, I love Jesus. It could be, oh, how I love Jesus. It could be, Jesus loves me. It could be, is there any spaghetti in heaven? <laughs> Whatever. <clears throat> in any case, and, uh, and while my father did his trick, Brother Babcock would sit on his organ bench and write a song, words and music from that title. And at the end of the trick, he would then sing and play it back to the person uh, who gave uh, who gave him the title for that song. Uh, there were over 8,000 songs written in my father's uh, ministry and, uh, by Brother Babcock as they traveled around. My father said there was a new song born every night. Uh, one, uh, occasionally some were buried the next day, but most of the time <laughs> they hung around. In fact, uh, uh, there are some of them that are uh, multiple verse uh, songs, some of them are just choruses. We've taught some of them to you folks when we've been here before doing vacation, family vacation Bible school in the past. Uh, songs like I'm going to heaven, you can't wait, and uh, you can't run with a skunk and smell like a rose, and those kind of things uh, are there. But uh, on that record, my parents, uh, my father and his associate only had one recording for young people, for children, and it's called Unusual Songs and Stories. My father used to add on to that for kids 5 to 95 uh, on there. But uh, that is uh, that recording. It was on cassette. We digitized it, cleaned it up, uh, repackaged it, uh, put, they got it uh, in good shape for uh, re-releasing the folks uh, to be able to get a hold of it. And it's, it's, a, it's a blessing. It has a number of different songs on there, like uh, the song they made popular, written by a friend of theirs, I'm No Kin to the Monkey. The monkey's no kin to me. I don't know much about his ancestors, but mine didn't swing from a tree. Uh, that's on there. Uh, there's one on there called Back Pew Baptist. There is one on there actually called Is There Any Spaghetti in Heaven? Uh, and uh, there are lots of other uh, songs uh, on that recording as well that Brother Babcock wrote. There are some that he didn't write that are played by unusual instruments. Uh, my father used to play a theremin. That's an electronic instrument. You play without even touching it. Uh, so how do you do that? We'll look it up on the internet. You can find out uh, that way. Uh, he played uh, His Eyes on the Sparrow in that recording, complete with bird sounds in the middle of the verse, uh, all done on that electronic instrument as well. And he also played with a Marine band. <clears throat> no, not the entire U.S. Marine band, but the harmonic he played was made by the Marine Band Company. Anyway, that's a, uh, that was uh, that he played on there as well, uh, playing I'm Still Jesus, along with Brother Babcock on that. And uh, so a lot, of, a lot of different music on that. Uh, plus, there are two stories, dramatized stories. You know, the old-time radio stories where somebody would uh, narrate the story and somebody else with the organ in the background would put in all the sound effects and, 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 and the music and all the rest of that. That's exactly what those are, uh, that are two very clear uh, presentations of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as well, uh, using other stories to be able to get that across. In fact, I've known, I've heard people, I've had people contact me who said they were saved because of listening to uh, that recording and then one of the stories spoke in their heart and they were saved because of that. So praise the Lord for that. It's called Unusual Songs and Stories. There's a little tag underneath them on the table that shows you what it looks like. So it says this is the new CD for children here. Uh, and there are some of those in the bottom of the rack below the audio CDs of the thumb. So I just want to let you know uh, that is different. That's not been here when we've been here before and you'll want to be sure to get a hold of that uh, during the course of the time that we are here as well. I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to all the songs that are there. Before we get into the message and before we dismiss Children's Church this morning, uh, Cheryl's going to come. We want to sing one other song for you this morning, whether you're watching online or whether you're here personally. The Bible tells us that each one of us have divine appointments every day. There are folks around us who need to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ, and we may be the only gospel they never hear, the only Bible they'll ever know or read. And that's why it's so vitally important that no matter what age we are, we're laboring with Christ to point others to the cross. So many souls bowed down with sin, with no joy or peace within. They need a hope, a way to go, a life to live. Lift your eyes, the fields are white. Will you point them to the light? 
Tell them that Christ with open arms receives forgiveness. Point them to the cross, won't you point them to the cross? Twas there the Savior shed his blood, new life to give. Point them to the cross, won't you point them to the cross? For it was there the Savior died that we might live. Forever lost, no guiding light, millions grope in sin's dark night. They need a hope, a way to go, a life to live. Will you go, Christ's name to bear? Will you go, good news to share? Tell them that Christ with open arms receives forgiveness. Point them to the cross, won't you point them to the cross? Twas there the Savior shed his blood, new life to give. Point them to the cross, won't you point them to the cross? For it was there the Savior died that we might live. Won't you point them to the cross? By now we are going to be dismissing any of the children that usually go to children's church to go along with Ms. Webb. You'll be going down to the last classroom on the end of the hallway. Uh, this uh, morning, so if you normally head out to Children's Church, you can stand up right now, follow Mrs. Webb down the hallway there, and uh, you'll be meeting with her uh, in that room. Now, Mrs. Webb will be having a class every evening this week as well, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday nights. She'll be teaching any young people, I believe. She usually uh, puts that down from uh, second grade and under for that class. Uh, but uh, we'll uh, I'll let her determine uh, all of that. But yeah, I think I think we got all everybody this. Going away, everybody is, is, is already gone. So anyway, uh, she'll be doing that in the evenings as well. So if you invite folks to come and they say, well, we got younger children, and they might cause a commotion in the service. Tell them that's all right. Bring them along with you. They can enjoy the commotion the web's causing the first part of the service with the puppets or whatever. And then when it's time for the preaching, they will be dismissed to their own class, not a babysitting class. It's an opportunity for them to hear God's word on their own level. While the rest of us get to listen out here, we'll have to worry about pinching someone, holding someone down, or giving a dirty lecture, and backing up uh, on the end of the row, somebody else. And so uh, let me encourage you to keep that in mind. In fact, it's been uh, this uh, uh, last couple of years, we keep running into more and more people who weren't just saved in our meetings, but were saved in Mrs. Webb's class. There's a pastor that was introducing us to his church uh, last year, I guess the year before last, uh, and he, in the introduction, said he was saved when he was a boy in Mrs. Webb's class. And uh, praise the Lord for that. We were in another church in Maryland, not far from where our home base is. And uh, there was a fellow that approached Cheryl and I before the service one night. He said, hey, I'm glad I got you both together. He said, I was just talking to my brother, who's a staff evangelist for a Christian camp in Pennsylvania. And he wanted to be sure when he found out you were here to tell you thank you because he trusted Christ in Mrs. Webb's class when he was a little fellow as well. And so praise the Lord for that. Some people say, well, can a young fellow, a young person that age really understand? I hope so, because that's about the age I got saved. And uh, so uh, I hope that uh, you'll keep that in mind as well. It's better to get folks under the gospel the earlier they are in life. It's easier for them to come to Christ because the older they get, the more resistance they develop and all the rest of that. So let me encourage you uh, to uh, be inviting as many folks as you can to come to the meetings. We want to help you in these next few nights to reach folks around you. And don't stay home because we're going to be presenting a lot of the gospel in the next few nights' messages. There will be plenty of things for believers as well. But I want to encourage you, take the opportunity. What's happened, I've seen around the country, is that many churches during this whole COVID situation have gone into just a holding pattern. And just everybody just trying to get by and get through or whatever else that way. But many have, have failed to reach out with the gospel to folks who are lost. I mean, of all times when there are people uh, around who need to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to continue that work and not let the devil hinder us from doing that work. So I want to help you in being able to do that this week. You say, it's hard to get people to come out to church. Well, tell them about the puppets. Tell them about the chalk art. Tell them about the special music. Tell them about all the other things 
that are going on. That's why we do all of these things we do in order to help you be able to attract folks, invite folks, and get them to come uh, to the special meetings, make it easier for you to be able to do that. And so I would encourage you to take that opportunity this week. Don't let these few days pass by when you could have perhaps gotten a family member or a next door neighbor or a friend who didn't know Christ to come and to put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to take the opportunity this week that we're sharing with you to be able to do that as well. So we'll do everything we can to present the gospel clearly so they can understand how they can be saved. You'll do everything you can to get them here to hear that message of the gospel as well. If you have your Bible, I would ask you to turn with me to the 126th Psalm, Psalm 126 this morning, for our scripture text from the Word of God for this morning. Psalm 126 this morning, the Word of God. <clears throat> I believe tomorrow night I will be preaching on the subject of the precious blood of Christ. Why is the blood of Jesus Christ so precious? Uh, there's so many ways the Bible tells us. We'll talk about those tomorrow night. And I think on, on Tuesday night, We'll be preaching on uh, on what faith really is. Or a lot of people do not I don't think I understand what faith truly is. And we're going to preach about what is what is faith. And, and I would ask you, uh, as a, if you are a believer, uh, even as a believer, have you robbed the Lord Jesus Christ of the very thing for which He died? Ooh, what did, why did Jesus die on the cross? A lot of people say, "Well, I believe Jesus died on the cross to get us all off the hook and out of hell and into heaven, so we can all be happy." That's a pretty humanistic view of the gospel. It's all about us. It's not about us, it's about him. It's all about him. And we need to, we'll, we'll be talking about that in part of the message on Tuesday night as well. So don't miss out on that. I believe there are a lot of people who have trusted Christ as Savior, but they're still robbing the Lord of that very thing for which he died on that cross of Calvary. So we'll talk about that Tuesday night. And then Wednesday night, uh, we're gonna preach on a passage of scripture that everybody loves. John chapter 14, verses one to three, when the Lord Jesus Christ essentially said, I shall return. I shall return, we're gonna preach on the subject of the rapture of the believers. So let me encourage you uh, to be back on each one of those nights. Uh, bring somebody who needs to know Christ. Any one of those three nights, they'll hear the gospel and there'll be things for believers on those nights as well. So join us uh, for those days. You need to get out of the house anyway, right? You've been locked up in there for the last year and all the rest of that. So uh, help lead folks out of their houses and to good places like the house of God. No better place to be than with God's people in God's house. Psalm 126, you found your way there. I don't hear any pages rustling anymore. So if you would stand with me in honor to the word of God, if you're able, would you stand with me as I read our scripture passage? Only six verses. It says, when the Lord turned again, that captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again in rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Let's remain standing for prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us together on the Sunday morning of your house. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who is all-powerful above all things, even a minute viruses known as COVID-19. Lord, we, uh, we do pray that you would help folks, Lord, to uh, trust you, to step out by faith, to be here themselves, to be inviting others to come. And Lord, would you use us this week to be able to help others who need Christ. Lord, above all things, and even at this time in their lives, they need the Savior. And Lord, I pray that today that, that we might let you use us this week in helping others to come to the Lord Jesus. Even if we sung about this morning and we send the light to, to the lost and help us to bring them in. We ask in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. You may be seated this morning. If you look at the passage of scripture we're studying this morning, you notice that between the designation Psalm 126 and the first words of the first verse, there's a little notation. It says a song of degrees. Why does it say that? Is this psalm any warmer or colder in temperature than the other ones around it in the book of Psalms? No, it just simply means that this is one of about 20, 15 or 20 psalms that are grouped together here in the middle of the book of Psalms that were traditionally sung as the people of God made their way by degrees up the ascent route to the city of Jerusalem into the temple to worship the Lord. No matter where you came from, if you were going to the temple in Jerusalem, you had to go uphill to Mount Zion. And so as God's people uh, would make their way up the hill from whatever direction they were coming from, there would be a traditional place where they would stop and recite a particular psalm. Then they would make their way farther up the road, stop again and recite another psalm. And they would continue to do that all the way till they came to the temple to worship the Lord and to offer their sacrifice for their sin. And so this is one of those psalms that was traditionally used at that time. Many of them talked about the power of God, the might of God, the majesty of God, the love of God. 
But it's one I want us to study this morning at the beginning of these special meetings this week because it speaks to all of us about being redeemed to responsibility. Redeemed to responsibility. Would you notice three things with me from our psalm this morning? In verse, uh, verse 1, there is a release. There's a release. The Bible says, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. What does it mean here when it refers to the captivity of Zion? Well, it's not talking about the 400 years plus of bondage that Israel was in Egypt in, in, in slavery. This is talking about the Babylonian captivity. Think of it. Israel had already made it to the promised land, but having arrived there, they didn't obey God. In fact, they apostatized from the worship of the Lord, began to intermarry with the other folks that lived among them, and began to worship their false god. And so God sent a pestilence sometimes and famine sometimes, but in the case of the scriptures we're looking at this morning, God had sent Nebuchadnezzar as a sword in his hand to carry the people of Israel away into captivity to Babylon and of those who were left behind to run the country under the king when they rebelled he sent his general Nebuchadnezzar and after them and to call them and take them away and of those who escaped that culling the Moabites raided and took others away and the Syrians raided and took others away and the Egyptians from the south came and took others away so that Israel was literally in captivity all the way around the land of Palestine but unable to enjoy its pleasures itself unable to dwell in that land now you might remember in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 that when Solomon prayed the dedicatory prayer for the temple in Jerusalem when it was completed, that he even specifically prayed in that prayer, Lord, if your people should ever turn their backs on thee, if they should ever worship false gods, and you would send a pestilence, or you would send a famine, or you would send them away to some far off country in captivity, even if way off there in some other kingdom, they would turn and cry unto you at this place. Would you hear their cry? Would you forgive them for their sin? Would you restore them to their land? And we know the answer to that prayer of Solomon, right? One of the most quoted, printed, postered uh, passages of Scripture for weeks of revival meetings that's ever been used is 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. What does that verse say? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I can tell you there's a country I love with all my heart that needs to deal with that scripture said. You know that country as well. The fact of the matter is that's exactly what had happened. Israel had been carried away captive to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar and they had been there many years. Now they were under the rule of the Medes and the Persians and the people had cried out to God from their captivity and God had heard their cry. And so he placed in the heart of Cyrus the Mede, the king who ruled at that time, to give a command and a decree that anybody of the people of the Jews who wanted to return to their homeland and rebuild their homes and rebuild their temple to worship their God and rebuild their city of Jerusalem could do so. And I want you to keep this in mind, if you will, uh, that the people who are writing the words of this psalm are just the first wave of people who have been set free. Can you young people remember that for me? Can Jack, do you have to remember from Annabelle? Can you, can you kind of remember that? Okay, good. Uh, young people do better remember stuff than when we get older. You know, they start, your gray matter starts to, anyway. Uh, uh, fact that well, ours is burning out and yours haven't started using it. So you know, that's why you're better at that kind of thing. In any case, uh, this is the first wave of people who have been set free. So I want you to notice the first thing they're talking about here then is the release, the release. They have been set free. Hey, listen, that's the historical background of the psalm that we're looking at tonight. But it certainly has a, a, an application to each one of us, even though you may have been born here in the United States, the land of the free and the home of the brave, yet every last one of us here was born in captivity. We were born in captivity to something the Bible calls sin. How did I get to be a sinner? Well, as we shared with the folks that were here golfing yesterday, or had come from the golf course, that, that, that the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth, and when he made the world, he made a beautiful garden, Eden, and then made the first man out of the dust of the ground, Adam, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, and then put him into a deep sleep, took one of his ribs, that's what women have been good at taking ribbing ever since, <laughs> and made a woman out of the rib, and brought her out of the man, and they called her named Eve, and God placed the two of them in the garden home he had created for them, gave them one small prohibition, though they can rule over everything that God had made. He said, you may not eat of the fruit of the trees, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden, because the day you do that, you will surely die. We know that, that Satan came and tempted Adam and Eve, and Eve believed the lie of Satan, and she would eat of that fruit, she would ascend to a higher state of being and be like gods themselves. 
and she ate of the fruit and she gave some to her husband Adam who was with her the Bible says and he also did eat and so the scripture says in Romans 5 verse 12 wherefore as by one man Adam in the garden of Eden sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Nobody forced Adam and Eve to sin. They willingly chose to disobey God. And because of that, they brought not only sin, but the first consequence of sin into the world, which is death. God has said the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Ezekiel 18 verse 4. Romans 6 23 says the wages of sin is death. And so because Adam and Eve sinned, they began to die and eventually did die. And every human being from Adam and Eve down to you and to me has also willingly chosen to disobey God and they too have died. And guess what? So will you and so will I. Unless Christ comes back first. Because there's not a one of us who has been any different than Adam and Eve were. The Bible says in James 1, verses 14 and 15, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, and lust when it is conceived, bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. None of us knows when our expiration date is, but we have one. And the Bible tells us it is appointed unto men who wants to die, Hebrews 9, 27. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5, says, the living know that they shall die. And so uh, I would ask you, first of all, are you sure that if you died, you'd be on your way to heaven because we were born in captivity to that sin? Look around you today at all the people who are in bondage to sin in general or sin specifically. Listen, think about how many broken homes there are and broken health there is and how many uh, broken lives there are because of sin. Look at all the alcoholics who don't want to admit they're alcoholics, but whose lives and whose families are being destroyed by the alcohol. Some of them realize that they're an alcoholic and go to some program like Alcoholics Anonymous or Reformers, Reformers Unanimous and they go through the program and they come back out and sometimes go right back to the alcohol again. Why? Because they're enslaved to it. They're in bondage to it. How many people today are in bondage to drugs of some sort? You know, I met a, 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 a school teacher, a public school teacher in Virginia a number of years ago who told me she knew for a fact now that every single teacher in the public school in which she taught was on drugs every day. And that was the only way they could get through day teaching. There are a lot of people who realize that they're uh, in, in, uh, enslaved to drugs and they go to the hospital and they try to dry out and they come back out after doing that and they go back to the drugs again. Why? Because they're in bondage to it. It's hardly a day goes by on the news you won't hear something about the opioid epidemic we still have in this country. Look at the people who are in bondage to tobacco of some sort. Chewing tobacco, smoking cigarettes, rubbing snuff, whatever it is. There are people who, who are, are, can't say they can't afford to buy groceries, but they can they seem to afford to pay the exorbitant prices to buy cartons of cigarettes and smoke one after the other that way. Look, uh, there are people who realize what a terrible habit that is and how it not only harms them, but even worse, the people who live with them or ride in the car with them because they don't even have a, a filter to breathe the smoke through the, the, as far as they're concerned. And there are people who realize that and they try no smoke and ban tron, nick a ban. I even know one fellow, honestly, who tried eating cigarettes, hoping to make him so sick to his stomach he wouldn't smoke another one. But ended up going back to them again. In bondage to that. How many adults as well as young people today are in bondage to a crowd, even with all the social distancing that's supposed to be going on? Some people seem to be more concerned about what their folks at work or their friends at school or somebody in their neighborhood or their house at home thinks about them than what God thinks about them. Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. When we're more concerned about what somebody else thinks about us than what God does, then we're caught in the trap of the devil. And many are in bondage to that peer pressure of the crowd around them. And then how many people today are in bondage to the guilt of their past? You know, the devil knows exactly what things we think are so bad in our past that, that God either can't save us from our sin or that we can never ever do anything to serve God because of our past sin as well. There are people that I meet all the time who are living in bondage to the guilt of their sin. But I want you to realize, folks, folks, we need to be sharing you with others if we haven't learned it ourselves, learn it ourselves. And that is there's no reason for anybody to be in bondage to any kind of sin whatsoever. Why? John 8 verse 32 says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, you say, preacher, what's the truth? <laughs> Wrong question. Not what. Who is the truth? 
Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And when a person recognizes they're a sinner and cannot save themselves, realizes that Jesus Christ alone is the Savior who can and will save them if they'll call upon him, then they need to call upon him and receive his gift of eternal life. And at that moment, the Bible says, they can be set free. I, I remember an alcoholic who came to the altar in one of our meetings and was weeping at the altar after the service was over, came and shook my hand and said, Brother Webb, I've been an alcoholic and I didn't want to admit it, but I gave it to God tonight and I don't want it in my life anymore. See, he's, everything, every night that week, the first thing he did when he came to, came to church was come and shake my hand and say, Brother Webb, I haven't touched a drop all day today. And the next day, same thing. And the next day, same thing. I got a letter from his pastor two months later saying, tell Brother Webb when you're writing, I still haven't said to touch the drop. Praise the Lord, there's deliverance in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that school teacher I told you about? You know how she knew everybody was on drugs in her school? She had been too. Until the day she came to a Bible preaching church, heard the gospel and God gloriously saved her. She went home, threw away all her drugs. And God was so gracious, she didn't even go through withdrawal symptoms. In fact, she was so happy, bouncy, and excited that when she went back to school the next day that all the other teachers who were on drugs kept stopping by her classroom wanting to know, what kind of drug are you on? And she could share, I'm not on anything like that anymore. I've got Christ as my Savior. I don't need that stuff anymore. There's deliverance in Jesus Christ. There was a, there was a, that, I, I remember I told you, I knew a fellow tried eating cigarettes, hoping to make him quit smoking cigarettes and went back to him again. Well, one day, he finally rolled up a brand new package of cigarettes around a brand new $30 cigarette lighter and said, God, I do not want this habit in my life anymore. Only you can take it. Please do. Threw both items in the garbage can and has never touched another cigarette since that day. There's deliverance in Jesus Christ. Teenage girl came to me once in a week of meeting. She said, Brother Webb, I'm one of those young people that's got a group of friends at home that when I get, I go to Christian school, she said, I've got some good friends there, but when I go home, there's a crowd in my neighborhood that's always going around doing things that are wrong, and I hang out with them, and they're always getting me to go do things that are wrong too, and I just can't ever seem to say no. She said, but you preached in chapel the other day about being a, like Daniel and purposing in our hearts that we wouldn't defile ourselves, and I made that commitment to God, and she said, when I went home that day, wouldn't you know it, there was that crowd right there as soon as I got home, want me to go do something else that was wrong. I said, what'd you do? She said, for the first time in my life, Brother Barry, she said, I said, no, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm only going to do what pleases the Lord. I said, what did they say? She said, most of them laughed and walked away. I said, no. She said, yeah, the funny thing was the leaders of the crowd hung back behind everybody else. And when everybody else was out of earshot, they turned around, quit laughing, looked at me seriously and said, we wish we could learn how to say no like that. Let me tell you, whether a young person or adult involved in the peer pressure of the crowd around you, even the crowd leaders know who's got their heads screwed on straight. And they respect them. There's deliverance. In Christ, and there was the lady in Georgia after a Sunday morning service. I said, Brother Barry, I know God's forgiven me for my past sins, but I just can't forgive myself. I said, Oh, have you got higher standards than God? He said, Sure. I said, Man, you can't get a higher or holier authority than God Himself. And if God says He has forgiven and forgotten your sins, who are you to remember that? She said, I never thought of that. In fact, I like what somebody else said. If the devil unkindly reminds you of your past, kindly remind him of his future. They'll leave you alone for a little while anyway. There's no reason for anybody to be in bondage to any sin whatsoever when the Bible says in John 8, verse 36, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free, what? In theory? <laughs> no. Indeed. Indeed. I would ask you, have you been set free? Have you been released? Verse 1, there's a release. Verses 2 and 3, there's a rejoicing. There's a rejoicing. Notice it says, Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Would you notice? There's a twofold rejoicing here. First of all, there is a verbal rejoicing. It says, Then was our mouth filled with laughter, our tongue was filled with singing. So if you're truly born again, you ought to have a song in your heart. Amen? Even if you can't carry a tune in a bucket if you use both hands, you still ought to have a song in your heart. David said in Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of an horrible pit, out of a miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. In verse 3, he says, He hath put a new what? Song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Listen, the Bible says there's a verbal rejoicing. You ought to want to sing it. Ought to be a song in your heart. I wonder, what would a visitor think if they came 
to a special meeting here this week? Would they look around during the congregational singing and say, boy, look at all these dead pan faces. You only see the top half of most of them anyway, and what I see doesn't look so good. Hmm? Can they see the corners of your mask drooping or whatever because you're frowning behind that? I hope not. I, I ought to be looking around and saying, wow, look at these folks. Look at the smile on their faces. Look at the, the gleam in their eye. I mean, look at, look at how they're, listen to them sing. You know, when you're singing for the Lord, I tell people you always ought to sing two ways. Number one, from the bottom of your heart. Number two, at the top of your lungs. Okay? And that means three things. Number one, think about what you're seeing. I can tell some people don't do that while, I, while, while I'm looking out over the end of my horn during congregational singing when somebody isn't wearing a mask or whatever. I can tell because they're singing songs like, There's within my hearty melody. <laughs> Jesus whispers sweet and low. Must be really low because it hadn't registered on your facial features yet, okay? <laughs> Look, I can tell some people aren't thinking about the words they're singing. Number two, we not only need to think about what we're singing, we need to mean what we're singing. My father used to say, more lies are told in church with a hymn book in our hand, probably during invitation time, than any other time in our lives as we sing. All to Jesus I surrender, only surrender only some or none. He said, maybe the only song that people could sing in invitation time that many people could mean is, is take my life and let it be. I hope that's not the way he's singing either but are you are you thinking about what you're singing are you meaning what you're singing when you're singing and then number three sing it like you mean it sing it like you mean it i like the songs where they get the songs that say use the word shout where they shout where it says shout you know whatever we ought to be singing like we mean what we're singing we need to be showing folks what we're talking about is real and so we ought to have a, a verbal rejoicing we ought to want to sing it but we also not only ought to want to sing it we ought to want to speak it what did Jesus say in Mark 16, verse 15? Stay out of all the world and keep the gospel in secret. <laughs> That's not what he said. What did he say? Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Sometimes when I'm overseas somewhere preaching on a mission trip, they'll say, why did you leave your country and come halfway around the world to preach to us? And I said, because the Lord Jesus Christ, who left the glories of heaven and came into this sin-cursed world when the Father told him to go, uh, said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and I need to obey the command of the Lord Jesus. Are you, are you speaking that message of the gospel? Do you know how to take a Bible and share with somebody how they can be saved? Don't just leave that at the pastor. Some people are never going to come to the church to hear the pastor. Or hear the evangelists for that matter. That's why we need to take the message of the gospel to them where they are. You're not going to catch a fish sitting at home in a, with an empty bucket of water with a line in there praying for God to put a fish in there so you can catch it. You have to go to the creek or the creek or the pond or the lake or the ocean or at least the freezer section of the grocery store to find one if you're going to get one. Go where they are. And we need to do the same thing as well. Wear your mask if you've got to. Social distance as you have to. Show them a big screen on your 10-inch on your laptop to the tablet, you know, where the verses are. But let me encourage you, take the opportunity to continue to share the message of the gospel with it. Give them a track, you know, spray it with disinfectant or something before you do. But, uh, but uh, take the opportunity to, to pass on that message of the gospel to those who are lost. Open your mouth, speak about it. We talk about everything else, don't we? We need to be willing to talk about what's most important, the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's, there's a verbal rejoicing, but that's not all. There's also visible rejoicing. This is visible rejoicing. It says, Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. Well, how did the heathen know? Well, he saw these people leaping and praising God and singing the glory to the Lord and had the joy of the Lord on their face. And then just say, Wow, look at those people. They must have won the lottery or something. They said, The Lord has done great things for those people. And they replied, The Lord has done great things for us. Whereof is the reason why we are glad and we ought to be that way. There ought to be a visible rejoicing. i never forget the first mission trip I ever made was with another evangelist to India. And the first meeting we were in was a conference meeting, a, a kind of a missions conference of church planting pastors who uh, there was a major host pastor, had been in that area of India for many years, had had, had, had the opportunity to help in planting at least, I think, 15 churches 
uh, in that state and the, the, the bordering states around him. And so a number of these pastors from the other churches that were planted uh, came and brought some of the church members and brought the choirs to do special music and all kinds of other stuff that way. So there were two of us evangelists preaching. Sometimes we're both preaching each night. Uh, sometimes it was just one of us uh, from one night to the next. But it was Saturday night. It was Sunday to Sunday, eight-day conference. By the time it got to the and last weekend, there were over 1,700 people there uh, for each of the services. And uh, I'm standing nearby the host pastor who was talking to just a local church pastor from out on the shore uh, uh, of India. And uh, so I, I happened to hear this pastor that was from two and a half hours away. He said, you know, I have to go back to my church uh, tonight after service because I got church at our church tomorrow. He said, I can't be here. But he said, I sure wish I could have one of these Americans preach at my church. And I overheard what he said, and I said, excuse me, I, I, I didn't mean to overhear or to eavesdrop. I just happened to hear what you said. I'm not preaching tomorrow. The other evangelist is doing the final message. And so I'm not I'm not uh, slated to be on the program uh, to do anything like that. Uh, I'd be happy to preach at your church if you'd like me to. Well, he got all excited, showed up the next morning with a car and a driver, and they hustled me out two and a half hours away to this little fishing village on the edge uh, of the Indian Ocean there. And uh, when I got out of the car, half the village came to run and look at me. <laughs> well, why? Why? Because in in that state in India, Kerala state, people have Caucasian features, but their skin is very dark brown. I, of course, am not. Okay, so I was probably the only white guy that's been in that village for months, if not years, if ever. Okay, so they all came around and looked. Look at the white guy, you know, whatever that kind of thing. And, and, and then when I went to the church, I was getting ready to walk in the door and I, I didn't notice there were some shoes outside that I thought, well, you know, maybe that somebody's selling shoes here or repairing shoes outside or whatever, that kind of thing. And as I started to walk in, the pastor grabbed my shoulder from behind and said, excuse me, Brother Webb, would you, would you take your shoes off and leave them out here? He said, there are two reasons for that. Number one, we can't afford fancy chairs or pews like you have in your churches in the States. Uh, we all sit on the tile floor, so we want to keep that clean for people to sit on. But secondly, we consider the auditorium a holy place where we meet with God, so we take our shoes off our feet like Moses did. Now, you people did not do that today. You just tromped right in here with your shoes on your feet. <laughs> and for some people, that's probably a really yeah. good thing. <laughs> but they do it differently then. And, and when I stood to preach, uh, I had to have a translator. Now, I wouldn't know what most people think when I say that. It's, Brother Webb, how does a translator ever keep up with you? <laughs> well, just remember, it's only one sentence at a time, okay? So that's not such a difficult thing. Uh, in fact, there's one church in India uh, that is in Mumbai, uh, one of the larger cities there, uh, and it's an English-speaking church. And when I preach it, I'm preaching in English. But uh, India has 24 different states. Every state has its own language, never mind the tribal languages sometimes in that state. And then there's the national language of Hindi. So when I preach in that church, the pastor stands on one side of me and translates into Telugu, the state language, while a deacon stands on the other side of me and translates into Hindi, the national language. It's 30 seconds between statements I can make. Try right to freeze your brain now. <laughs> And so uh, when I preached it, I had to have a translator. Now, wait a minute. Let me ask you all a question. How do you suppose those people in that village knew I was not a local? How did they know I wasn't from that village? Well, uh, three things. If you're a young person from the room the other night, can you remember what I said? Okay. There, there are three things to tip anybody off. Number one, I had a different look. Number two, I had a different language. Number three, I had a different lifestyle. And you know, if you and I have accepted Christ as personal Savior, even though we were born here in the United States of America, if you were, and you're citizens, perhaps, of the United States of America, do you realize that the minute any one of us puts our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, our citizenship changes? Because the Bible says our conversation, the word literally means our citizenship is in heaven. And not only are we citizens of heaven, but according to the word of God, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, now then ye are ambassadors. Christ. And an ambassador is more than just a citizen. An ambassador is a citizen who represents the rest of our country to someone somewhere else. That means that you and I know Christ as personal Savior. You need to pay attention to the song they sing in the southeastern states. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Because it's true. This world isn't our home. We may have been born here. We may live here for a few years. But our home is in heaven. We're going to be there for all of eternity. And we are not only citizens going there. But we are to represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords from this world. Are you being a visible? A visible rejoicing 
Christian to the lost around you? Can they tell that you're not local from this world because you have a different look than they do? You have a different language than they do. You're not cussing and swearing, abusing your family members and the rest of that. And you have a different lifestyle. You don't live the way they do. How come you're so different? And you can introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ who makes that change in each one of our lives that ought to be there. And so there is a rejoicing. There's a verbal rejoicing. There's a visible rejoicing. I would ask you, is that true of you? In a society of contemporary Christianity today that seems to be bending over backwards to say to the world, you can still be like the world and be a Christian. I think about it. Isn't what they're saying? You can still rock and roll, just put God's word in it, call a contemporary Christian. You can still drink just as long as you don't get drunk. You can still gamble as long as you tie on your winnings to the church. Right? That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. Old things have what? Passed away. Behold, how many things? All things are become what? New. That's not what contemporary Christianity is. It's the same stuff the world's used to. That's why they can attract the crowds, because that's what they already got. Yeah. You realize in the big music awards program that takes place every February or March, one of the last ones they had, they had one of the biggest news things that came out of that. I even heard on the secular news was that they were talking about dropping the Christian category out of the awards altogether. You know why? Not because they're mad at Christians, but because it's so mixed in with all the other categories. You can't tell the difference. What a testimony is that for the world that says we're so conformed to it that they don't even, we don't even need our own category for music. What does the Bible say in Romans 12 too? And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the new of your mind. Change the way we think so that we approve of that good and acceptable for the will of God. So the word of God says, look, there's the, have you been released? Have you had the release? That's number one. Watch it online or here in person. Have you been released? Then number two. Have you had the rejoicing? Are you having that rejoicing? Do you have a verbal, sing it and speak it, and visible, different look, different language, different lifestyle? Do you have that kind of a rejoicing as well? Because then there's a third thing I want you to see, verses 4 to 6, before we close. There's a responsibility. There's a responsibility. Look at verse 4. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Whoa, 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 wait, 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 just a second. Hang on. Why does it say that? Is this an error in the word of God? I mean, at the beginning it says, when the Lord turned, past tense, the captivity of Zion. We were past tense like them to dream. Why now is it a future tense word? Is this an error? No, there are no errors in the word of God. You remember young people ask you to remember for us who was writing the words of this song? Did you remember? Uh, people that came first up Jerusalem. People who? Came first up to Okay, people who came first up Jerusalem or where were they, they coming from? Babylon. Okay. They came from Babylon and the rule of Cyrus the Mede and the Persians. They were the first set of people who were set free. The first set of people who had been set free. So they've already been set free. Why are they praying, turn again, future tense, our captivity is a stream from the south? Well, look, picture them. Here they are. They've been released. They're rejoicing. They're releasing. They're praising God. They're on their way back to Israel. And in the midst of rejoicing, one of them says, hey, wait a minute. There's still some of our people back there that had not gotten the word they go home. And someone said, yeah, you know, there's some of our people over there among the Moabites, and there are other ones over there among the Syrians, and some of them are down there with the Egyptians in captivity. They need to be set free, too. They recognized a responsibility toward the others of their people who had not yet been set free. And that's the same thing as us. Look, you don't even have to leave the shores of the United States of America to find people who do not know who Jesus is or why he came. We were talking about this yesterday, I think, with Pastor and I before, whatever, that on one of our mission trips, we were going to Scotland. And uh, I get an aisle seat when I fly on airlines anymore, so I get up and walk around and go back and stretch and do deep knee bends and that kind of stuff and, and, and keep the embolisms from taking place or whatever. And, and so I, it's also a good opportunity. I like to go back there where the flight attendants are 
so I can get a chance to talk to them. Sometimes you get a good witnessing opportunity out of that. So I was talking to a to a Scottish lady flight attendant back there and uh, told her what I was going to Scotland for when she asked and she said, well, why are you going to our country when we've got such a history of faith? And I said, man, that's the problem. It's a history of faith. You can go back a hundred years and find great preachers, great missionaries, but in Scotland today, those young people that are going to school aren't even hearing the name of Jesus Christ unless this is a swear word. They're taught from the youngest age they possibly can be secular humanism, evolution, all the rest of that. They don't even get a chance to make a choice whether they're going to decide to accept Christ or not. Somebody needs to tell them, but they're, look, our nation is fast catching up to that. In our schools, our public school system, where where you can talk about every other false religion, but you can't mention Jesus. You can't teach the truth. You can't read a Bible. You can't pray. You can't anything else. It talks about things of the Lord. Listen, uh, what, 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 a, what, a, what a terrible thing. I remember back even several years ago when, when President Obama was president and it was, you know, they were giving money to schools to build or whatever that way. Out here in California, we were in another part of the state. A family in the church had Bible clubs at, at a couple of public schools after school. But they had to use one of the old rickety buildings on the school property because when Obama gave out all that money, one of the regulations that went with it was if you take this money that we're giving out now, none of it, no building that uses this money can have any religious activity in it whatsoever. Let me tell you, the founders of this nation would have turned over in their grave. You go back and look at the Declaration of Independence and find out how many of those people who signed that document weren't just believers, but had theological degrees. Do you know why schools like Harvard and Princeton were first established? Go back and check it out. To train preachers of the gospel. You'd be lucky to find a preacher or the gospel on any one of those campuses today. Our nation is becoming a secular humanist nation. There have been past presidents who have said our nation is not a Christian nation. It's fast becoming that way. There are so many who do not know. You don't have to leave the shores of the U.S. to find out who Jesus is or why he came. You, you don't even have to leave this area, the San Francisco Bay Area, to find people who may be religious, but they don't know what salvation is. I remember without telling you a long story about the whole deal, a meeting we had once at a Filipino family's house we had been asked to come and do just a one-night service at that home. You know, we got there. They had 65 friends, neighbors, and relatives waiting. That was more visitors than we'd had during the whole week of revival meetings we'd had in their church. They fed everybody a delicious meal when that was over with. They took the tables down. They put the food away. They rearranged the chairs. They introduced their pastor. They introduced us and explained the reason why all of us had been invited by the host of the same place was so we could share with the host's friends, neighbors, and co-workers what was most important to them and it changed their lives and they hoped to do the same for their friends, co-workers, and my relatives. I did some ventriloquism with my dummy. My wife took the younger kids off to another room to teach them. I preached the gospel. Eight adults came to Christ that night. Two of them, after we had dismissed everybody, came to me and said, Preacher, they said, we have been religious all of our lives. We have been in church all of our lives. But this was the first time anyone ever told us that salvation was free. There are people like that all over Antioch all over Contra Costa County, all over Martinez, all over where you may live, Brentwood, Oakley. People who would come to Christ if somebody would get to them with a message of the gospel. We have a desperate responsibility to help get the message of that gospel to those of our people who have not had the opportunity yet to be set free. They're still in bondage. They're still under false religion and the power of sin and so many other things. And someone needs to take that news of them. And in closing, I want you just to see this. The Bible tells us about that responsibility. There's the sending of the soul winner. Verse this is five and six. They that sow in tears shall weep in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again and rejoicing, 
bring the issues with them. Okay, so what do we find? The sending of the soul money. Just like I said, you can't catch a fish with a line and a bucket of water in your house. You got to go to go where the fish are if you're going to catch one. Neither are we going to win souls to Christ seated in our comfy church chairs, praying for lost people to get saved, when well, we need to be going to them where they are and sharing the message of the gospel with them. Then there's the seed, or excuse me, the spirit of the soul winner. It says, He to go forth and weep it. One thing I've learned in 39 years of full time evangelistic ministry, and that is that the average lost person does not mind arguing about religion. In fact, some enjoy a good debate over religious philosophies. But the average lost person does not know what to do about a Christian who is so definitely concerned about their lost condition and so convinced of the truth of the gospel that they weep when they leave. I can tell you story after story after story. I won't do it. Just take my word for it. Of people I know in meetings that I've seen trust Christ as Savior, people thought would never get saved. But who were saved because the spouse wept for them. Remember one big tall fellow? that was saved out of a false religion once, he literally ran down the aisle the night after his little boy stood between me and his daddy as I was trying to witness to his daddy after the service that first time he'd come and raised his hand and hadn't responded. And with tears said, Daddy, Mommy and I are going to go to heaven and we're going to be with Jesus. Daddy, you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. Daddy, if you died, you'd be alone. You'd go to hell and you wouldn't be with Mommy and I. Next night, that man ran down the aisle, asked the pastor to show him how to get saved. United his family in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll tell you another story about a lady who became so broken for her family she couldn't sleep at night. And her husband was awakened by her sobbing. Her the teenage boys that were going to get a snack at night past the bedroom heard her sobbing and stopped and listened and heard their names called in prayer and went back to bed. The next night was a family night of their Bible meetings and all three of them ended up going with her to the service, two boys and a husband. And when the invitation was given, the husband was the first one out in the aisle, followed by one, two teenage boys who locked arms with dad and came marching down the aisle to Jesus Christ with a leap and praising God mama right behind him. Some people think they're going to argue their spouse to Christ. They're going to debate the guys that work to Jesus. They're going to pressure somebody to salvation. No, listen, what we need to do is ask God to give us tears. Jude 22 says that some have compassion making a difference. My wife encouraged a young lady in our church during a week of revival meetings to come forward one night and the young lady said no. It broke my wife's heart. She started to cry. The next night I invited the same young lady in the invitation to get saved. She stepped out immediately and went and got saved. Her mother was telling me why afterwards. She said when I went to, to, to put my daughter to sleep last night said I turned off the light. Was get, or get ready to turn off the light and turned around. My daughter said mom when I looked said my daughter was crying. 16 year old girl in uniform. I said, Mom, I didn't know Mrs. Webb would cry if I had to get saved. Go see Christ the next night in the service. We need to ask God to give us a burden. Compassion, tears. Jesus in Matthew 9 36, when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them, for they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And then finally, this morning, not only do we see the, the sending of the soul and the spirit of the soul, and it is the seed of the soul. Winner. It doesn't do any good to go out and weep if you don't plant the seed in people's hearts. What's the seed? Mark 4, verse 14, Jesus said in the parable there, the sower soweth the word. It's the word of God that's the seed. I'm convinced the average Christian is not an effective soul winner because many believers in good Bible believing, fundamental Bible preaching churches, even like this one, Christians calls, don't even know enough of the gospel scriptures to tell somebody how to be saved. For example, you know the Romans wrote of salvation? You have that marked in your Bible? Can you, can you remember what the verses are? What's that series of several verses that are all in the middle of Romans? You, you know which one to start with. You can just write after that one, the next chapter and verse, and after the next one, the next chapter and verse, you don't have to bother with the book name because it's in the same book. Follow it verse to verse to verse like road signs on a road to lead somebody to Christ. Oh, you say, I've got that marked in my Bible. When's the last time you've used it? And if you have it, great, but that's not all. You need more than that. Because you're going to run across somebody who's going to say, well, I'm doing the best I can. How come my works won't get me to heaven? Can you answer that from the Word of God? What about somebody who says, well, I got baptized on that washed away my sin. Can you answer that from the Word of God? What if somebody says, well, I was born into a Christian family. Doesn't that make me a Christian too? Can you answer that from the Word of God? Because you see, it does not do any good. 
for anybody, if we stand knee to knee, toe to toe, or face to face with somebody and say, this is what my parents taught me to believe growing up. This is what my pastor's teaching me to believe, or my place of worship beliefs. Because they can say the same things. There is no authority in those things. The only authority we have is this book. And that's why you'll notice when I preach, I try to quote as much scripture as I can, because that's where the power is to work in people's hearts. And that's what we need to share with people as well. Oh, it's great to tell them the testimony of how you got saved or whatever, but plant the seed. Or water seed somebody else planted. So I said, well, Brother Will, I tried that once, and I witnessed to somebody and didn't get saved, so I gave up. Oh, really? Let me ask you. Anybody here know any farmers that expect to harvest their, their field the same day they planted their seed? I don't. Do you know any farmers who, who two weeks later, when they're out there turning the irrigation pumps on to water their seed out there, in the field, anybody think they're going to reap their seed that day either? No. But they know that if they plant and that they water, by God's grace, there's going to come harvest one day. And the Bible says that we're partners together in the labor of bringing people to Christ. You never know what the job is that God's opened that divine opportunity for you to do. And I want you to stop and think about that. I call them divine opportunities. Why? Because God put them in our path. And I want you to realize, if you will just do and say what God said to do and say, whether or not that person accepted Christ at that appointment, you did what God told you to do. You obeyed the Lord. You accomplished the task God put you there to do. Some plan, others water, but God give it the increase. You may share the gospel with somebody, it's the first time they've ever heard it. Don't be surprised if they don't get saved, by the way. You may talk to somebody who says something like this to you. You know what? I used to work with somebody else, and they told me the same thing you are. <laughs> Hint, you're watering the seed that's already been planted before. I thank the Lord sometimes God uses that to bring somebody to the place where they're ready to get saved so when you go and share the gospel with them, they bow their head and they trust Christ as Savior. Not a one of us can reach around and pat ourselves on the back because somebody else planted it, somebody else watered it. All you did was harvest it, glean it. And all of that, no matter which part of you were doing, is done by Christ through us. You guys said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. So you cannot fail if you will do what God says to do when he says to do it. Divine opportunities to share Christ with others. My wife and I were traveling back from visiting our daughters. It used to be my youngest daughter and her family lived in San Diego. They helped plant an independent Baptist church down there. And once it got off the ground, they got called out now to, of all places, Chicago area to help plant a new church there. It left the world, the, the country's most liberal state in the country to go live in the second most liberal state in the country. Anyway, uh, that's where they went to Chicago. And when they were living in San Diego, one of the last years they were out here, we would, we would, we would at Christmas time, because we finished our meetings right before Christmas, we would uh, use some of our frequent flyer miles we'd earn for mission trips and fly out to San, uh, to uh, Phoenix, where my first daughter lives, my oldest daughter lives two and a half hours from Phoenix. And we'd rent a car in the airport to go visit her for a week and then drive seven hours to San Diego and spend a week with my other daughter and then turn the car in there and fly back to uh, Baltimore, which is usually where we flew out of uh, any airport from where our home church is is two and a half hours away. So Baltimore happens to be the one we use a lot. In any case, uh, we were supposed to fly from San Diego through Philadelphia to Baltimore on our way back home again. It was, I think, the 16th of December. And uh, my pastor happened to tell me that there was a nasty ice storm that was supposed to be coming from our church's direction, the east toward where the airport was. And so uh, he said, it's a good thing you're going to get home before that. Before that starts, it's supposed to be like 4 a.m. We're supposed to be home at 9 o'clock. Well, the flight was late leaving San Diego. And uh, by the time we got to Philadelphia, we thought we'd missed the flight. So we hurried to the gate, but we didn't have to hurry because the ship co-pilot had not showed up yet. And so they had to delay the flight. And then they delayed it again. And then they delayed it, I think, two more times that night until finally at 1130, they canceled the flight altogether because the co-pilot never did show up. In any case, they uh, said, we can put you on a flight 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And said, that is completely unacceptable. we got to be home. we got to be home before this ice storm starts. We gotta, we're supposed to be ministering our church on Sunday. we got to work on some music and stuff. And then we have to get home. And they said, that's the best we can do. So I told my wife, all right, look, let's do this. Let's get our luggage back and we'll rent a car and drive to Baltimore. It's only two hours. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm sure he's there. I know how to get to the Baltimore airport. No sweat. We can do that. So we were down in the lobby waiting for our luggage to come back on the carousel. And there were some other people getting theirs to go spend the night in a hotel and fly out whenever the airline was going to send them out or whatever. And there was a lady doctor there 
who was going around asking if anybody was going to Baltimore that night because she had an important appointment the next day. And the only people who were willing to offer to take her were these car companies that wanted to charge her three times what it was worth to do it. Thankfully, she wasn't listening to them. But I walked up to her after I, I realized what she was doing. I said, ma'am, I'm an evangelist, not a terrorist. <laughs> and I said, my wife is right over here. And I said, we're waiting for our luggage because uh, we're going to drive to Baltimore tonight. We need to get back home before the storm hits and all the rest of that. And I understand, I heard that you need to get, she said, yeah, I have an important appointment tomorrow. I said, well, ma'am, I just want to let you know, we're going to rent a car and drive it tonight. And I'm from Philadelphia. I know how to get to Baltimore. No sweat. I've done it all many times. And we're going to have an empty back seat. Uh, if you want to help pay for the rental car, you can do that. I'm going to try to get that out of the airline. Anyway, I just want you to know, we're going to Baltimore tonight. We've got an empty back seat. It's going to stay empty unless you want to fill it. That's your choice. No charge. She went over and sat down and talked to Cheryl for a few minutes, I guess, to make sure we weren't terrorists. And when she was finally satisfied, she said, okay, I'll take you up on your offer. So our luggage finally came back, all of ours, and we, uh, we, we got shuttled down to that rental car facility at the end of the uh, airport, and uh, we got the car rented, and we got our luggage in, in the trunk and everything, and we got in the car and started up. Honestly, Cheryl will tell you, we were not even out of the rental car parking lot before that lady doctor leaned up over the front seat between the two of us and said, so what's an evangelist? You know what the Holy Spirit does when those things happen, those divine appointments? You know, you can't miss them because the Holy Spirit says, now! <laughs> right? The problem is, too often we hear the Spirit of God say, now! We say, who? Not now. Not that person. Well, the Holy Spirit said, now! And so for the entire two hours from Philly to Baltimore, that lady hung over that front seat and asked questions and clarified this and said that again and tell me how to do that again and whatever. When we dropped her off, finally, her car in the airport, a uh, parking garage and pulled out. Cheryl looked at me and said, well, we know why that flight got canceled to make it. Look, I'm trying to encourage you. There are divine appointments. Even circumstances you wonder about happening in your life sometimes are divine appointments that God set to be able to talk to somebody. When the Spirit of God says no, don't say no. Prepare your heart with the Word, the seed of the Word of God so that you can plant that seed in that heart. They may get saved then. They may not get saved then. You may just have planted it. You may have just watered something somebody else planted. But trust God to give the increase. And what the people are rejoicing in, look, that, that's the last thing. There's, there's the sending of the soul winner, the spirit of the soul winner, the seed of the soul winner. And there's also, actually, if you read it, the success of the soul winner, because it says, he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with, what? Rejoicing. Ah, there's rejoicing again. What were they rejoicing about at the beginning of the song? being released. What are they rejoicing in at the end of the song? The harvest. The harvest they're going to reap. You and I, if we will have a boldness to go and the burden to weep and the Bible to plan in their hearts, we can get the blessing of seeing some soul come to Jesus Christ. And only when we get to heaven will we realize how many other folks may have trusted Christ as Savior that we, by the grace of God, gave us a party. And we didn't even know it. Until then. May God use us this week, in these next few nights, to reach out to those around us. But may he give you and, and me an alertness every day from here on out to look for those divine appointments. To be prepared. Look, I'll just put it this way as we close. If you will provide the person, here I am, Lord, send me. And you will prepare the person. What are those verses again? Mark them in my Bible. Meditate on what they mean. Memorize them so they're prepared to be used. You'll provide the person and you'll prepare the person. God himself will provide the power. And he will produce the fruit. Let us, who have been released, have a verbal and visible rejoicing. And take our responsibility to reach the others around us who have not yet been released. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. As they're bowed and our eyes are closed, I wonder if I can just ask a couple questions. Obviously, I can't see hands of people that are watching online. But I would encourage you to answer the question in your heart anyway, whether you're in, present, in person or not. I wonder how many here can say, how many folks can say, Brother Webb, you know, praise God, I do know for sure there has been some time in my life when I've been released 
when, when I heard the gospel and I turned from my sin and I trusted what Jesus did for me on the cross and I took his gift of eternal life and if I died right here right now I'm absolutely certain that I would be on the way to heaven how many can lift a hand and testimony to that only if you're absolutely sure of that fact you lift it just where you are let the redeemed of the Lord say so this morning amen praise the Lord let me put those hands down question number two I wonder if there's somebody here this morning that would say, Brother Webb, I couldn't say that for sure. I am not truly certain. I am not 100% certain. If I was to die right here, right now, this minute, I really don't know whether or not I'm going to go to heaven, but I would appreciate it if you'd remember my hand in prayer this morning. Please pray for me. I'm not asking you to join anybody's church or stand up and give a speech or get baptized or anything else that would embarrass you. I'm simply asking, may I pray for you? Is there anyone like that here today that would just slip your hand up just where you are? Let me pray for you this morning. You wouldn't like that at all, Brother Webb. I really am not sure. I really do not know for certain if I was to die right here, right now, this minute, whether or not I'm going to go to heaven. Here's my hand. Pray for me. Anyone like that? Anyone like that? If you're watching online and that's you, I would encourage you to contact the church. You can do that through the church website. You can find the phone number there. You can find the address there. You might even find an email address there. I, let me encourage you, if, you, if you're not really sure whether or not if you were to die today, you'd be on your way to heaven, contact the church. Somebody will help you to get the answer to that as soon as they can. Let me ask one other question. How many born-again believers here today would say one of two things? Brother Webb, either God's Spirit spoke to my heart about the fact that I still need to be released from some old habit I've been hanging on to in my life, maybe that's hindering my witness to the lost. And I, I need to ask God to change my life. I need to have that verbal rejoicing and I need to have that visible rejoicing. God spoke to my heart about that. Or you could say, Brother Lynn, God's Spirit spoke to my heart today about the fact that I've not been a testimony. I've not been an active witness for the Lord Jesus. I need a boldness to go or I need the burden to weep or the Bible to plant in hearts so I can have that blessing of seeing people come to Christ. Would you remember my hand in prayer, one or the other, or both of those two things? Here's my hand. Pray for me. How many believers will slip a hand up today where you are? Yes. God bless you. I appreciate those hands that are being raised today. If you need counsel this morning, just a second, we're going to stand. The pianist is going to play a verse or two of an invitation song after I pray. I told you I'd pray for those that have asked for prayer this morning. And I would challenge you if there's a need in your heart and you need to talk with somebody, you need to counsel with somebody, the pastor will be here at the front. <clears throat> Brother Josh will be here at the front too. There are others here that can talk with you or they can point you to somebody. We'll pray with you. And help you with that need in your heart. Let's stand very quietly, please, for prayer this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your precious word. Thank you for the, <clears throat> the testimony of these people who had been released and put it in a song that they recognize their responsibility. Lord, help us to be the same. Thank you, Lord, for those that have been saved for our release. It wasn't anything we could do. It's what you did. And now, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be sharing that message of the gospel. Even this week and even beyond the days of this week, Lord, a perfect opportunity this week. If we haven't gotten down yet how to share the gospel with somebody and need to talk to somebody about how to do that, Lord, I pray that folks will take that opportunity. But, Lord, I pray that they would realize that we're going to be sharing it very clearly in the next few nights. And one of the things they do is just get somebody to come. They'll hear the truth. They'll hear the gospel, what they need to know to be saved. Lord, they may not even get saved when they hear me preaching, but they will hear it. And Lord, your work will be accomplished. So Lord, I do pray that you would have your will and way to be done in our lives. For those that are believers today who maybe are still struggling with some old thing of this world, some old habit that should have passed away by now, I pray, Lord, that you give them victory. I pray that they would submit and surrender that fully to thee. And Lord, I pray that you would give them uh, a resounding victory over those things. That Lord, even those who know about that issue in their life will recognize and realize your power in them. And Lord, I pray, Father, for my brothers and sisters in Christ who, Lord, perhaps have heard your now many times and have said no. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be a testimony, help us to be a witness, help us who have been redeemed to take our responsibility to reach out to those around us who need to know Christ. Give us a boldness to go. Give us the burden we need to weep when that's necessary. Give us the Bible knowledge and the desire to learn the scriptures we need to and that, the ability to retain it in mind and heart so that we can share your word with folks who are lost. And Lord, we thank you. You've promised that your word will never return void. It will accomplish the purpose run to it sin. So bless we pray. Bless we pray. This invitation time today, we ask those decisions we made that would lift up Christ and glorify his name. We pray in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. As the pianist plays, just a verse or two of an invitation song right now. 
pastor's here at the front, Brother Josh is here at the front. If there's a need, you need counsel today, you need to talk with somebody about it, I would encourage you just to step out and come and find them here. And I'll be happy to sit down with you or have someone else do so. And that uh, you might have the counsel, that you might have someone help you. If there's a need in your heart to settle matters in your life for the Lord, then I would challenge you whether you walk an aisle. A lot of the churches folks don't do that. You can sit down where you are right there in your row and talk with the Lord. I've seen an awful lot of folks since COVID has been going on that have just sat down or, or turned around and kneeled down right in their own row and talked with the Lord about what God spoke to their heart about through a message. So I just challenge you to do what God wants you to do today, to settle matters in your life with Him. Ask Him for what you need. He'll not withhold it. He already wants you to be the witness that you haven't been. And He's the only one who can enable you and empower you to do that. I challenge you to take that opportunity today to talk with Him. If there's something that you're struggling with in spiritually in your life, some old thing in the world that maybe is keeping you from being a witness to others because you're afraid somebody's going to point their finger at you and call you a hypocrite, then there's one way to settle that, don't be a hypocrite. The way you settle that is by talking to the Lord about that and giving God the opportunity to give you victory over whatever it is that's hindering your testimony. Of course, if any one of us can help you, we hope you'll let us. I don't drag out invitations, but I, I, I do want to just give folks a chance to make sure they settle matters with the Lord. This will be the last sins of plate, and then Pastor, uh, Pastor Osterman will come and close our service. Challenge you with us the other three nights. Be praying, be looking out for those divine appointments that God has for you at work or at school or in your community. Look for those divine opportunities. And when the Spirit says now, don't say no. stay after uh, today we, we do have lunch and uh, look forward to enjoying fellowship together let's pray again father we thank you for the food that has been provided for us we pray for your blessing over our refreshment time we ask that you continue to help us to see that even more necessary than our daily bread is the spiritual food that we receive from your word Help us, Lord, not only uh, to be in services like this one where we're receiving the preached Word of God, but, Lord, to be in front of the Bible every day, talking with you and listening to you from your Word. Strengthen our church, fortify uh, us against temptation, and testing, trials. Help us, Lord, to trust you through it all. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed. Thank you.